three currently. Yeah, that's not going to be a problem. Um, so perfect. Well, <laughs> we made it, Russ. We made it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that was, man, that was harder than designing a synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, beautiful, beautiful. That's that's actually not a <laughs> well. And and the thing is, it's 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 always one of those things that uh, uh, it's 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 a toy course, uh, uh, a coin toss. Uh, it, it's it, it either goes smoothly straight away, or it uh, it's it takes some time. So, uh, but still, we we are here. We are only a few minutes late, so that's no problem. Um, cool. So if you're ready, I would say uh, let's kick this off and um, yeah, let's uh, see where we can get to, to with this. So all right, um, cool. Yeah. So the um, the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, well, first off, uh, thank you so much for joining Russ in your um, in your busy schedule and making sure that you uh, are able to uh, tell us all about everything that you do. Um, for everyone who's listening, thank you so much for joining. Um, we're going to do this the exact same way as we do all of our shows, but if this is the first time you're here, um, yeah, um, we're going to do a, a very friendly open open chat, and after a while, typically around the, the 30 minute mark, we're going to open it up for everyone else to uh, join us on stage and then uh, ask away, of course. If you are unwilling or if you are unable to uh, join us on stage and ask your questions, uh, please uh, feel free to use the companion channel um, on Discord to uh, well, just ask your questions or give any feedback during the interview. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible, of course. Um, well, that being said, I think we uh, we can get started. Again, Ross, thank you so much. How's your day been up until now? Yeah, hey, uh, thank you for having me, man. It's, it's cool to be here. Um, my day's been all right so far. It's been... Uh, I've been doing taxes all morning, so Ooh, it's exciting. <laughs> exciting. Yeah, pretty, Ooh. pretty pretty boring, yeah. But so that, yeah, I've been doing that for the last few days. Oh that's not something that, that you uh, really get a lot of energy out of, of course. No, that's why I started a company actually, so I could do that. <laughs> Stop me bored. Yeah. Well that, love... otherwise no, uh, uh, just just a suggestion how about just become an accountant then you can do taxes all day every well, day of the that's, year that's, that's, that's what my jewish mother in new jersey wanted me to do my <laughs> <whole life>. so, <laughs> that's that was already in the cards and i stepped off that path you know oh. but here i am you know it's crazy because it's like you look back on it and it's like your parents are like you know you should work in the city you should get a real job you should be an accountant you should do this you should do that and it's like oh i want to be different mom and um <laughs> here i am right where i'm supposed to be doing that <laughs> doing stuff. taxes oh geez yeah man. oh wow 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 uh but just 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 for my understanding and, and and the the company that's your uh that's that's your day job as well or are you doing anything else beside that or i also um i i do work for there's a a company called pjrc that makes the teensy some people might know what that is it's oh yeah a small <laughs> circuit so I, I i do all the soldering for them too Oh great! Uh, um, yeah, so it's it's you know a lot of drag soldering, but I have some guys that help me out, and I do that, and I do the muffins Eve stuff, and that's it. So, so you actually pronounce yeah. it muffins Eve? That's also interesting. Yeah, which is probably the completely incorrect pronunciation of. Well, no, it's no, but, the, no, yeah. it, it's actually quite close because um, the, the 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 pronunciation is exactly like you do it but it's not zeef it's done zeef but that is zeef okay yeah, yeah but that that's that's not yeah. a a sound that's that common in the english language i would say yeah uh, but still. um but yeah the word is is pretty interesting oh yeah absolutely because um, people keep asking me about it yeah so i actually recently got to find when i found the word it was like um when i was in college i i performed with a professor and we used that name as our performance name yeah and um, it came across because we were looking at like a bunch of like old radio stuff and just like weird early 1900s electronic mm -hmm. stuff. And I somehow came across like a Wikipedia article for that. And it was really small at the time. I tried to find more information on what a, a muffin safe is. Oh, wow. yeah. And it was only until like, you know, t two or three years ago that I found like little bits of information online about it. And then recently uh, I found a video online. Uh, from a museum um, like talking about the 
the the whole backstory of the um, of the device, and I got to a point where I found the original pamphlets that were dropped from the planes to instruct people on how to build one. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. So that all happened recently. Yeah. And for anyone who's listening, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, the the name of the company is named after this device from World War II that was used to block um, Nazi radio jammers and get the radio in from um, Radio Orange to help instruct the Dutch resistance and give them like passcodes and stuff. Um, so that's yeah. what the company's named after. It's a Dutch word and it's it's kind of a slang. It's kind of a slur towards German people. So yeah, uh, well, and it's it's it. it's it, well, it's um the word muff would be you might say it's a derogatory term for yeah. a german but it's it's not like the n word or anything it's um yeah it's 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 um it's something you would never say to a to a german you're friendly with uh but in the heat of the moment um, <laughs> i love i love i love i love germans though I just didn't oh yeah same so same for me i don't like i don't and... like nazis it's different <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a that's a very yeah. good <laughs> uh so, yeah <laughs> that's, so, that's something that you that makes sense to say that absolutely yeah yeah so i apologize for my bastardized pronunciation of it yeah no um, no 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 but, you know. But you might still hear the the word "muff" c- come up every time the uh, the Dutch have to play the Germans, or uh, uh, when it's uh, when whenever soccer is involved, you might still hear yeah. it. But yeah, <laughs> I actually right just on. linked to the um, to the history page on your website. Yeah, there's, in the there's a page on my website. Channel. Yeah. yeah, I love that. So the only reason the only reason I brought it up is because that's like a really recent, like that's only like a few months ago that I was able to find the original schematics. Yeah. from the pamphlet so it's like the the pamphlets were dropped out of the allied planes with this schematic from this local radio guy this local engineer and i was i was looking up his whole backstory too it's like really fascinating stuff um really but you is, know yeah. i i i thought it was really cool and i i mean that's like where the name came from and everything And it was like 10 years ago that i first found out about it and me being able to get this much information in the original dutch it's pretty cool and then someone uh translated it for me too which was really neat um, like word for word, so oh, I don't think I've great, put yeah. that up. Yeah, someone someone helped me translate the uh, video, and someone else helped me translate the um, the actual text. So it was, oh, it was pretty is, awesome. Yeah, it is, and especially as, as you said, the um, the actual pl- pamphlets dropped by uh, like the RAF. That's uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. I want to find it, it. Something I was trying to do is find the original, like those actual documents those original pamphlets because i'd really like to have a copy of that but i can imagine yeah um, yeah but there was a ha- guy even, even then still how did you then 10 years back because it's not a very common common word but you were of course in uh, working it with radio equipment so, yeah I, it, it was just a bizarre random rabbit hole on wikipedia and i just plopped on this one little wikipedia it was like a three sentence uh descriptor about what a muffin thief was with an image and that image is what the logo is now, and that image is actually on the history page too. Oh, great! Yeah, um, it's like a picture of an original one from the '40s. Super. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, and if anyone's interested, like obviously you can look it up or whatever. But just really briefly to explain it, it was uh, you would hook up a variable capacitor to two leads basically in between your your radio. And then you'd connect one end to a shower curtain rod and the other end to your stove in your kitchen. And those would work as gigantic antennas, basically. <laughs> and you would tune it. You'd sweep the cap, the capacitor in it until you'd knock out the jammer signal. Um, but, yeah, it's that's in, cool. It's so ingenious. So when, I, when I first read about this, 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 this was all like, okay, well, there was someone with enough... Um, understanding of how electromagnetic waves works worked and how these jammers worked, and then just with well, with the tools available, was able to think of what well, if we if we then throw in this this and that, you might actually be able to 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 uh, to circumvent that jamming. That's just in- ingenious. Yeah, it's pretty. I don't know. I think it's really cool. Absolutely. 
That's great. <laughs> anyway, this is like now we're like on like the History Channel or something. I feel bad for anyone who came. Everyone's like, man, I want to hear about like dumb noise synths. And I'm going to be like, well, back in 1942, the Dutch resistance of the RAF. You know, it's like, so, sorry. No, but still, sorry. no, but we, we need to go on these tangents. That's that's what this show is all about because we, we need yeah. to. I had uh, Marianne Hedonia on this show on Tuesday and we, we spent like 15 minutes just talking about uh our favorite recipes so yeah we need to go on these tangents we need to see how far these rabbit holes go so no worries about that whatsoever um but while we are um a bit on the subject because you said well 10 years ago you were playing this with your uh with your then professor uh yeah if you you think back to even to even further uh further back in time so what was your musical upbringing with with your as you already said your your jewish mother who wanted you to be an accountant (laughs) (laughs) um i music was always a part of my life from a really young age um so we had a piano in my house and my my dad used to play piano a lot just Mm -hmm. like random stuff and um you know it was like at a really young age my parents were like kind of pushing me to be like hey play the piano play the piano like do stuff like that like you want to like play in the school band and all that so uh you know i was like playing piano and guitar and bass and drums and stuff at a really young age and playing with friends up and through high school and then i started making electronic music when i was about like 14 or 15 Mm -hmm. and um it started with on my i think it was like around seventh grade i remember buying a alesis micron at guitar center on sale and i used to make all like all of my earliest electronic music was made entirely on that keyboard with just a single encoder scrolling through like a shit ton of menus and the music was obviously just absolute garbage like it was terrible you know what i mean (laughs) but i I used to spend like hours and hours and hours trying to put together entire songs with an alesis micron oh wow and then it was it was insane it was so dumb and then when i was like 15 my cousin ricky showed me ableton and i had ableton for a while and i was using that for a long time and then in college i started um messing with modular synthesizers and max msp and all of that stuff um and that's kind of you know i've been making electronic music for a while now and mm-hmm. i don't feel like i've really been able to actually do it the way i want to do it until very recently because i've finally been able to afford to like get the equipment that i want and use it in a way that mm-hmm. i've wanted to where it's like really hands-on and tactile and um spending very little time doing technical things and a lot more time like actually like playing music and, and being know, creative doing all... as well yeah yeah and it's like i feel like i used to spend a lot of time just kind of like scratching my head or banging my head against the wall trying to figure out like oh how can i get this thing to do this or whatever and now it's like i'm in a position where you know everything is hooked up and it's all very easy to connect to each other and i can kind of just immediately start playing so Damn. that's been really really cool and that's that's also a fairly recent development um that's, so. that's perfect, and and, and from a from a, from a musical influence point of view, um, growing up, what kind of music was played around the house, and what kind of music oh, did you man. used to, uh, used to, did you used to rebel against your parents? Any, any anything that well, stood out I didn't, there? Or? I didn't. I honestly, I kind of really like my parents' music, and it is like really cheeseball bullshit. But like, <laughs> I was, you know, like we were like a huge like Simon and Garfunkel and Paul Simon household, and like big Beatles household and like Paul yeah. McCartney, Crosby, Stills and Nash, um, like Joni Mitchell. My mom didn't like Bob Dylan's voice. So we never listened to Bob Dylan when I was younger, which is really funny, <laughs> but like Pink Floyd, like all that, like cheese ball boomer bullshit. Yeah. Um, but I kind of really liked it. Um, and I still like a lot of that music and that's definitely mm-hmm. influenced even my really weird experimental stuff it's like there's still like paul simon at the heart of all of it which is pretty funny oh that's great <laughs> um, and like honestly like awful like musicals like i can't stand musicals at all but like my sister was in all the plays and stuff when she was younger mm-hmm. and into musicals and stuff so she was always listening to like 
you know, like Rent and like Wicked and like Les Mis. And it's like, <laughs> I just remember at a really young age just being like, oh my God, like I hate, like get this out of my head. Like I hate this so much. You know what I mean? Like all these like, earworms like that are going to be stuck yeah, in, your, it, in your head. Yeah. yeah. It was like nails on a chalkboard that have just actually become part of my DNA at this point. It's like all of this horrible music is like deep inside me. It does explain a lot, of course, uh, from, from a Freudian yeah. perspective. You could actually yeah. say that this explains a lot of the the modules that you've designed as well. Yeah, maybe because yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but it's <laughs> like, you know, I find myself myself still like listening to Bridge Over Troubled Water every once in a while, and being like, "All right, mm-hmm. cool." <laughs> and just go on that on that well on that journey again back to your childhood, and then do that. But yeah, that that there would have come a time where you said, "Okay, well, f this," and I'm I'm just gonna find my own. Uh, uh, music uh, and and rebel and listen to yeah. to electronics, listen to punk rock, listen to metal, anything like that that happened during that time later on. I'm assuming. Yeah, I, a little bit, but honestly, it's kind of always been there. I don't know. I I never really like as much as I've wanted to be a rebel and be like, you mm-hmm. know, fighting the system. But it's like I never did any of that. It's like the closest I've come to doing that is like making a stupid noise synthesizer. You know, it's like I'm actually like a pretty. <laughs> square dude when it comes down to it Mm -hmm. um which is kind of hilarious too when you think about it um but uh i don't know i mean all the kind of experimental stuff and left field stuff Mm -hmm. I, i was exposed to in college and i was really into it for a period of time but i've kind of honestly at this point i've kind of moving past it and trying to figure out how it fits into other stuff like um I'm just really trying to get back to like music at its core and I feel yeah. like I spent a lot of time doing stuff that was like non-music or noise or kind of mm-hmm. experimental or whatever and um it distracted me from like making music basically so I'm trying to now like incorporate all of those things into like making sort of more accessible and traditional music rather than constantly trying to like do something else or push boundaries or whatever it's like no i kind of just like want to write a catchy tune Mm -hmm. and if there's some like weird glitchy shit on top of it for six seconds like yeah i'll use this 300 hundred dollar module i made (laughs) but still indeed so you 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 do get you do get some 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 additional uh well value you might say by that well, you might even call it a, a a bit of a sidetrack you did the, back then, where you said, "Okay, well, I'm going to go on this experimental uh, journey." But I, and eventually, you you got back to where you where you were beforehand, saying, "Okay, I want to get back to pure musical um, songwriting, but still incorporating all of the things that you learned during your well experimental sidetrack." Is that is that a good way yeah, to describe it's like, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the experimental music that i was interested in and trying to make or whatever i mean it's um i think it it helped change your thinking like the way you think about things like Mm -hmm. i feel like now i treat actual music composition in a way where it's like kind of more spectral where like you know when you're making ambient music for instance you'll have like or at least the way I do it is like I treat it as like a kind of spectral thing where you have like things that are really low frequency, things that have like mid frequencies and things that have really high frequencies and you kind of paint with the faders, you know, like, like using like paint brushes and paint colors in and out. And I feel like that kind of thing I've tried to take back. Like when I'm like writing music now, that's more melodic or whatever, where it's like a, a melody or baseline or something will sit in that spectral slot in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll try to, you know compose that way where it's like using the musical notes to fit um you know something that used to be just a sound wave or something yeah. sitting in that same slot um so there's some things like that and like i've definitely like my way of thinking about rhythm has changed a lot since working with modular stuff um you know like my sequencer on my system is this whole clock divider thing that i used to do for you know a mm-hmm. while like when i would use max msp where the whole idea is that you basically have a chain of clock dividers that are being modulated, but they're all kind of um, tied to the same macro. That's what mm-hmm. I used to do a lot. So yeah. in the case of uh, 
my system, I use the deviant as like a global randomizer for the whole chain, like the whole tree of stuff. Um, and it's like those little things like that, like I'll like be doing a track now that's kind of like straightforward and then I'll want this layer over it. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm not using my sound palette from my system, and even if I'm not using my sequencer from my system, I'll think about engaging with those other layers in that type of way where it's like there's this clock thing that's kind of running by itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm not necessarily sitting there plugging in exactly when it hits on the one or whatever. Um, so yeah, there, there's some things that I've, I've definitely taken with me now, yeah. but I will say that, you know, it's kind of funny. Like I don't really use my own equipment that much and I don't even really make noise music. Um, and it's like, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really bizarre. Cause it's like, I don't even like the things I do with modular synths and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't even necessarily believe in ideologically. <laughs> I don't know how to say it any other way. It's like, yeah, I'm doing all this weird noise stuff or whatever, but it's like I don't even I don't even do that. Like I'm not like a harsh noise guy or mm -hmm. you know. So it's funny cuz it's like I'll 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 try to be Paul Simon and then put glitch on top. Of it. No, but still, but uh, I, I I like that 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 uh bit of almost schizophrenic approach to music making where you say okay well you you have this this drive towards um uh, towards that music making but there is something in you that you probably wouldn't have even have em embraced or incorporated into your own ego which still pulls you into uh, the noise stuff or at least makes sure that it's still in there and that's 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 an interesting approach i would say yeah thanks man um i just like there's there's a lot of artists that i look at that do a really good job of that mm -hmm. and I've just like I've I've been listening to her a lot lately too, just because my buddy asked me to do a thing for him and he used her as a reference. But Bjork does that a lot, and that's what I love oh, yeah. about like Homogenic and Vespertine and those records where, um, you know, it's that like really gritty, distorted thing, glitchy thing happening on top of something like really, really pure sounding. Mm -hmm. And take it or leave it. Some people hate Bjork's music, but I think I think it's mm -hmm. awesome. I think yeah. that um, my prediction for 2022 is actually that people will reinvent or uh, refine their own uh, appreciation for Björk, especially the the the, the mid 90s stuff or the late uh, mid to late 90s stuff that she did uh because that was as you say that was that was that was pure genius and i it's do really have good yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I find myself citing it a lot in my head as a reference. Like, I'll be making something, and I'm like, oh, man, this is, like, a thing on a Bjork record that I've heard a million times, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, a lot of that's becoming obvious to me now. It's like you were asking about earlier music. It's like, I find myself doing these things that I, I'm kind of doing them, like, unconsciously, and then I look back, and I'm like, you stole that from a radio head song <laughs> that you liked when you were 13. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. Whoa. Oops. <laughs> Uh, but still, you know, uh, well, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And and of course, there there is, um, just like well, uh, just to follow up on your um, analogy with with painting that um, that that scene when you're working on on an ambience, there are only so many colors you can use, so you're bound to reuse some of the colors that others have already used. But it's up to you to make the composition with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah oh perfect perfect and, and then of course well just a few um a couple of steps back and um how did you then actually get into the whole modular because you said okay well um you were into those uh, uh, uh synthesizers you were using your yeah. uh, what's it called again the elise's micron and then the elise's micron. so yeah yeah so when i i guess it was like in high school i was doing stuff with like um Ironically, I was doing noise stuff in high school and wasn't had no idea what noise music was, and I like didn't perform or whatever. But I used to just like tie a bunch of pedals together in a feedback loop. Um, nice. And I was like doing that. I was making terrible pop music. Like I've I've been making really bad pop music for like a really long time now <laughs> since I was like fourteen or fifteen. And I've kind of stopped doing that as much, but I've written some incredibly embarrassing songs that are really bad. Um, and I did that with like. Ableton and a laptop and an Alesis Micron for a long time. And then 
at the end of high school, I was like doing stuff with like pedals and feedback loops. And I was like trying to like mimic early animal collective stuff like sung tongs. And I was mm-hmm. like doing these like, you know, bizarre like audacity recordings and stuff. And then when I got to college, I was still doing the bad pop stuff, but freshman uh, freshman year of college, there was a Dofer A100 system mm-hmm. um, in one of the rooms. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Oh my <laughs> God, is that what I think it is? You know, because I remember my only other notion of what modular was is like when I was really young, there was a video of Johnny Greenwood performing on um the analog i was gonna mix up i don't remember if it's analog systems or analog solutions but Mm -hmm. um one of the the big modular systems doing idiotech and i was like oh my god i want that because i was like obsessed with radiohead when i was really young and i loved all (laughs) the um stuff that johnny greenwood would do with the maxim sp and the modular and the owns martin and all that stuff so that was kind of my earliest introduction to those things um, so I saw that and I was like, oh my God, that's like what Johnny does on Idiotech. And like had that like classic, <laughs> classic experience of like walking up to a modular synth and having absolutely no idea what the hell is going on. Like what's in, what's out, what the hell is this? What is mm-hmm. CV? What's a gate? And one of the professors who was there, who was like the dude was this guy, Matt Akers. He still is this guy, Matt Akers. It's one of my closest dudes from there. I love that guy. But he was like, I teach the modular synth class here, you know if you want to use it, you have to sign up kind of thing. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay, cool. And then very quickly he was just like, ah, oh, you can fuck around with it. Like, I'll show you how to do all this stuff. And then I developed this amazing relationship with this guy where he kind of took me under his wing and he like taught me max MSP, like the fundamentals of it. And he like taught me everything I needed to know about modular synthesis. And this was before I even signed up for the sound art or modular synth class. It kind of just took me under his wing and it got to a point where, you know, we started making music together and he was like, he like lent me, an 84 HP row of Eurorack that had a phonogene and maths and oh, wow. a filter in it. And I was like, holy sh! like what? You know? And it was like, <laughs> I, I had this amazing little skiff that, that he loaned to me. And I was like, when do you want it back? And he was like, I don't care whenever kind of thing. Oh, and that boy. was in like, I think that was in 2012 or 13. I don't remember when the phonogene came out, but. Um, it was it was sometime around then that he started lending me Eurorack modules, and we used to make this wacky, weird sound art stuff and perform in town, and, and you know, for like three people, because this was in Savannah, Georgia, where I went to school. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, it was cool. It was like just kind of me and him playing around with modular synthesizers, and then I remember like uh, I was using the phono gene, and I was like man, I really wish I had a phonogene that did this, you know? Yeah. And then I was like, I'll just try to make a Eurorack module. And, you know, um, I I still to this day, I'm like not, uh, I'm not an engineer at all. And I'm, I like kind of have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to electronics themselves, mm-hmm. like actually designing them and, and working on them. So um, not much has changed since this moment, but I was like, oh, I want to do that. And I was like, I don't really know how to do that, but I'm going to like figure out how to do that and like ask a bunch of people on the internet. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, that's how the GMO was made. And that was in 2015. I was working on that or 2016. And um, I've kind of just been like going down that whole rabbit hole since then. Um, so I've been playing with modular for like, I don't know, like three years before I tried to make my own module. And, but still, that's um, quite a, it's quite a leap to say, okay, well, I, I, I fall in love with this thing and I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to take the dive and take the plunge and really start building my own and actually starting to sell them as well. Yeah, and, you know, I was doing DIY kits and stuff before then, like soldering them pretty poorly. I mean, honestly, man, like I went into this entire thing with like, it kind of just jumped, you know, it's like jumped and then figured out how to fly on the way down kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of like a Hail Mary move and... I'm pretty stoked about it in the end. Um, and I still don't know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and I say this, like, every time I'm in any interview or every time I'm, like, teaching a workshop or whatever the hell, everyone's like, oh, my God, like, you're an engineer. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm an idiot art student who works really hard, <laughs> you know? Like, that's it. It's like I, I just figure out a way to do the thing and I do it. And it might not be the best, but it's the thing that I do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so you know anyone listening who like wants to build something or whatever they're like oh I got this crazy idea it's like 
I always say this. It's like, well, just, just do it. Like, whatever. Like, just figure out how the hell to do it. And then the other thing, too, is everyone's like, oh, I don't want to, like, put in all this time and money for something that nobody's going to want to buy. And it's like, there's always, at this point in time, like, yeah. it, it's really hard to see on the front end of everything. But it's like, the world is huge. And it's like, I guarantee you, you can find a few people who would buy the thing that you made. Like, th- there are so many people in this world. And I always think about this. Anytime someone places an order with me, I'm just like, what the heck? Like, where are these people? And it's like, you know, I ship all over the world. You know, I got customers all over the place, but I'll get these like, you know, someone in Australia in some weird random ass town in Australia will buy just a tote bag, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, why? What the hell? You know, and I'm like, well, they're out there. It's like somebody in remote Australia wants to buy a ten dollar tote bag from you, even though you're in Portland, Oregon. So you put it in the mail and you ship it to them. You know, it's like your weird synth thing that you want to make, your stupid eighty five dollar contact mic. There's probably three or four people on the internet who'll buy it. You know, absolutely, like, yeah. It's so bizarre to think about, but it's like you can exist in this like completely. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it's like. I feel like the products that I sell and make like don't really make any sense for any kind of market, but it exists. And there's other people who do what I do and you know, they they're existing. So it's like it seems like a completely implausible and bizarre thing and it is, but mm-hmm. it works. Mm-hmm. So oh, but that's just kinda how yeah. it works. But do you think that that is because the the overall evolution of modular and, and Eurorack is so well, it's still so extremely quick and still so extremely, um, uh, you might even say erratic currently, where people are still trying to figure out what they want, what they need. And do you think that that evolution will eventually stop? Or do you think that that's just going to be an ongoing force? You know, I, like a few years ago, I thought that Eurorack was completely dead. I thought Eurorack was dead when I started the company. Because I was like, oh, my God, I'm, like, so late to this. There's, like, all these people who are doing all this stuff. Like, where could it possibly go? And, you know, mm-hmm. that was only, like, five five years ago or six years ago or whatever. Yeah. And now I, like, see where things are and where they're going. And it's, like, I kind of stepped off the train because I don't like where Eurorack is going at all. And I don't, I don't, I'm not making modules anymore. But I'm still, honestly, at this point, I'm actually kind of blown away with what's getting made. At, at one point, I was, like, a sourpuss. And I was, like, this is dumb. This is, like, beating a dead horse. Blah, 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 blah. But now I'm, like... Dude, people are putting like eight hundred dollar laptops behind like a thirty two HP panel, and it's got like cooling fans and stuff. I think it was like a Strymon thing that I looked at the back of, and it looked like I was like, "What the hell is this?" Like, it's just like insanely dense. Like LZX, Lars lives down the street from me, and I'm, like I'm like buddies with those guys, and I went over, and his new uh, I don't even know what the hell the thing is called. It's like the gigantic wide thing that he's working on is like literally like. 10 circuit boards stuck together with like thousands of tiny 0402 <laughs> components and I'm just like dude you are doing NASA grade engineering in your basement you know and I'm just like holy hell this is awesome like this is getting like <laughs> crazy and it's like I have no place in that world at all anymore and it's like that's totally fine but my notion of what your rack was supposed to be for me kind of ended already Mm-hmm. And I kind of don't want to be a part of like as a user, even I'm mm-hmm. saying it's like all of the newer stuff I'm not really interested in. And like I would if I were to do everything all over again, like I would have just gotten a dough for a 100. Like just that's it. Like a vanilla, totally modular synth. Yeah. And um, as much as I love all of these crazy things that people have done, you know, I, I feel like in my mind the best way to use a modular synthesizer is like as it was originally kind of designed as where Mm -hmm. it's like this kind of open format circuit that's kind of patch programmable and to be honest with you now that i think about it someone that does keep making stuff that i think is doing that in a cool and interesting and new way is uh schlappy engineering my buddy eric schlappy oh yeah absolutely Um, you know because he to me is is one of the few companies that represents the kind of like og modular I- ideology where it's like very much influenced by surge yeah where you have these like superpower circuits that have like all these functional crazy input output things like you know like the the um 
the universal slope generator and stuff. Yeah, like the boundary as st- well. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. It's like you can use it as well. I'm talking about surge right now, but yeah, 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 Schlappy, indeed, yeah but then the Schlappy has the boundary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got the boundary, and there's like you know the quadrature oscillator that also does like distortion and stuff or whatever the hell it does. I mean, and it's really cool. Um, so that stuff's really cool. But um, that whole idea though of like having a system like that where it's open circuitry that um just does a raw kind of function and isn't sexy and doesn't have all these features and everything that's mm-hmm. not what i want out of your rack personally no. but i understand where it's going and i understand why people want to do that but for me it's like you're basically recreating a daw for like 20 times the cost you know with <laughs> all these really delicate electronics and maybe those are fighting words for some people but it's just that's kind of how I feel about it now. No, 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 but I, I, I understand what you mean. If you, if I um, so I recently got the um, uh, the Empress Effect Soya Euro Euro Bureau. Wow, that's a, that's a tongue twister, and that is essentially yeah. a a modular synth uh, in a module. Um, so I understand where yeah. you're coming from, and that could be um, that could be a good sense for for someone who uh, who's looking for something like that. But if well, you indeed embrace, like you said, the more pure uh, approach, like oh, I, I actually just want to use this with a very specific yeah. and very um, utilitarian uh, approach to it, then of course that this goes str- uh, right against that that commitment. Well, it's like I understand the people who use your rack as like the ultimate touring thing where it's like you go and you show up with two rows and you can do a whole set or whatever, which which mm-hmm. is pretty neat. And that's definitely something I can do or or people that even make, you know, experimental music and ambient music with it where you kind of need all the CVIO and everything like I understand all of that. But mm-hmm. for for my contextual like where I want your rack to fit in my journey with music and electronic music is it's like I kind of view it as another instrument in your studio like a violin or something where it's like this thing has this capability like it can do these types of sounds and that's kind of what it does yeah rather than having this completely flexible crazy music making environment that people seem to be making now where everything ties into like a sequencer module or whatever it's like at that point for me it's like i'd rather use other equipment or even honestly just a laptop you know yeah um but um that's how I view it now where it's like, okay, the modular does, you know, in my situation now, it's like I have my modules, which I use very infrequently. And the only modules that I have left are, um, the entity kick drum from city state fate, which in my opinion is, it's my favorite kick drum that I use on everything pretty much. (laughs) Um, so I kept that because that is like a self-contained thing. And then in terms of modules, I literally only have a maths, a Tobavrilla multi filter and a micro VCA2 from Intelligil and a, a noise generator. And I do like 98% of what I would do with a Euro rack with just those four modules. And I use them all the time on production and stuff. I'll make percussion with them, I'll mm-hmm. process stuff with them, um, I'll do any kind of weird audio or uh, amplitude modulation stuff I have to do or tremolo or whatever the hell. It's like I'm using it like an actual Swiss Army knife thing and that to me is like how you should use it um so um yeah that's kind (laughs) of that's kind of my euro rack rant and then the noise boxes i don't know i just make them because i i used to um i used to make that type of like droney ambient stuff and i kind of always wanted things that just did that and um that's that's it yeah, but but it's like, oh, here's the box that makes this drone sound, you know. Um, <laughs> but I don't even, I don't even, I don't even really make drone music anymore. No, indeed, indeed. But do, do you do you foresee a yeah um a, 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 any sort of module that you say, okay, well, this is going to bring me back into starting to uh, to make modular again? Are there specific things where you said, okay, well, if I'm ever able to uh, create something like X, Y, and Z, then I'm just gonna. Uh, then I'm going to jump right in in there, or is that just a a closed chapter well, for you I, altogether? Yeah, I, in terms of like commercially producing modules, I'm I'm done with it. Um, yeah, I just you know I'm, I'll probably make you I'll continue to make Yorak compatible stuff. Yep. Um, yeah. but I, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's like I'm I'm just so not personally invested in it anymore that it's kind of hard to to muster up the energy to do it. You know, I'd rather allocate my energy during to things that I'm excited about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, um, 
yeah, I kind of got everything I wanted to get out of my Euro rack fixation and I'm kind of <laughs> just interested into other stuff. You know, I'm thinking now cuz I've always had this idea of keeping the company as this very open-ended thing and yeah. Um, you know, it's cool to kind of shift out into a sort of bigger picture of like, well, what other devices can I make that may or may not even have anything to do with synthesizers, you know? Yeah. And um I've been eyeballing like thinking about designing like 500 series stuff or even like a rack unit or something because that uh that entire world is is what i'm really interested in right now um because my setup is basically just like a bunch of rack gear um you know i have my my studio setup is literally a closet in my living room and it's like really small (laughs) so i'm like okay i need i need like rack stuff you know so i can kind of just like throw it up and that's it and it's good or like smaller kind of things um and i'm like finally getting into outboard gear and stuff now now that i can afford some of those things and that has just been completely life-changing you know i was using the same like sapphire pro 40 interface you Mm -hmm. know i got it for like a 100 bucks for a while and it was just like okay well i can't even really can't really get this to the standard that i want it to be you know Mm -hmm. and um now that i get to start using some of those things i'm like man like what could i do like could i make like a weird thing that people could use in their studio i don't know you know because i don't know i i don't know anything about it. and like i said it's like i'm a horrible engineer so maybe putting something with an iec cable on the back of it is actually a really dangerous legal liability for me and i probably should know what i'm doing before i build rack equipment you know it's like maybe that's sticking that's like literally and figuratively the moment where i stick the fork in the socket you know um so uh i'll probably need some help on that if i do that um, but I don't know. I'm just yeah. kind of taking a step back now. You know, I just did that. I just finished that box with Boy Harsher um, called The Runner. And that was a lot of fun. And it was also a lot of work. And, you know, I made and shipped 250 of them in yeah. a very short period of time. And, you know, for some perspective for people that are listening, like my company is literally like just me. And I have I have some guys that help every once in a while. Um, you know, come over and like help me take washers off of 3000 pots or like, you know, clip a little metal tab for four hours or whatever. But for the most part, it's like, I'm the guy soldering everything and putting it together and shipping it out and designing it and doing all that. So it's just like really, uh, exhausting. So I've kind of, I'm kind of shifting away towards the idea of like having a bunch of things that are always in stock and now like really thinking about like, okay, like maybe I'll make like one or two devices a year and I'll make a few hundred of them or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. cause it's just really physically difficult to do. And it's also very hard to find help. Um, and, um, yeah. So that gives you a lot of freedom though. You know, it's like, I don't really have to keep up with a, um, you know, like a, a constant addiction to new things cycle and like new module of the month or like, you know, cranking things out. Yeah. Um, it's like and you approach it a bit more like you know? like like a um i mean it's like honestly like artist, it's like how yeah. well it's like how most people approach making music it's like they work on an album they put out an album yeah. maybe they do a tour you know it's like you do a thing and that's what you did this year and yeah. that for me mentally is like you know okay if i do that i can kind of contextualize it financially in my life where it's not ruining my life and it's not you know i'm not putting everything into one basket and i can kind of like play the long game you know yeah like see how long i can do this for and kind of you know because keeping a bunch of things in stock requires having a lot of people on a payroll it requires having a big shop it requires having tens of thousands of dollars tied up into things that may or may not sell you know it's like Mm -hmm. this whole huge thing and instead if i can kind of keep it as just you know one guy in a small shop with some help every once in a while putting things together it's like i can totally live with that you know yeah um and there's plenty of people in the world who have followed that exact same model for a really long time and they're still doing it so yeah um and there's a certain allure to doing it like that as well where you say okay i'm just gonna create like you did with the other uh things you just mentioned like the runner i'm only going to do 250 of them and that's that and if you Mm -hmm. were to do the same thing every every year then people would actually expect that and they would know when yeah. to be uh, keeping an eye on your shop and if they really want it they can get to it uh, but at the end sure. of your year you can just say well that's one page turned and i can actually start and go um 
Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure like if demand for something surged to a point where it was like insane and people are like clawing the flesh off of my body, like yeah, sure I'll do another run or whatever. But mm-hmm. it's like you know the the likelihood of there needing to be 250 more drone synthesizers in the world, I think, is extremely low given the current state of affairs in the world. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like first world problems needing yeah. a drone synth. <laughs> Well, I did um, when I when I started to reach out about this uh, this this episode for today. I did get a lot of people asking me, "Well, do you know if he's if he's going to be uh, uh, reintroducing this or that module?" Uh, and so th- there is apparently um, there is a need out there. Um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm getting some 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 side questions already in some of the uh, the the the, the, uh, the channels here too. Um, so uh-huh. this was actually <laughs> so good good example here. Uh, Gearhor says, um, uh, "Will you be bringing back the Mito?" So we, well, we'll, 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 no, we already have I the won't. answer to that. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is like, um, you know, something that people have been nagging me about since they first heard about my modules, and something that I've been thinking about is like, okay, well, if you're not going to make them anymore, can you kind of incorporate them into something new? And the answer is, yeah. It's like I've been doing that, you know, and I'm going to continue to do that. But like, for instance, like. For anyone who's listening who may have just asked me about the Mito, um, it's uh, I took that idea and I kind of recontextualized it into the pocket clock it, which is cheaper yeah. than Mito and is, you know, uh, USB power and all these other things. So it's like, no, it's not the same thing, but it's like if you're interested in generative clock divisions and stuff, like uh, I designed the pocket clock it to do the things that Mito does in a cool way and in a new way and uh, you can now save it and you can do other stuff too and it's like Mm -hmm. you know a third of the price or whatever and if that doesn't float your boat I understand but it's like the ideas are kind of carrying on into other things but um, I don't really want to sustain production for anything for too long basically so um, you know you can do what Mito does uh, yeah you can do what it does with a lot of different equipment, you know. It's like, absolutely, um, yeah. And I think so. that the, the 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 comment you made about um, that whole evolution of going from neural rack into more uh, standalone, into more desktop, into more rack oriented stuff. I think that the pocket yeah. clock is, of course, a great example there. Um, sure, yeah. Where you can That's say, like a little yeah, trinket. Well, it's I, I would <laughs> I wouldn't even classify it as a trinket because I think that that could potentially be one of the most powerful things that people can incorporate into their uh your rack system if they if they are so inclined um and then of course the, the the question is well do people actually see that or are they of the well understanding well it's not a module so it won't fit in my rack yeah i don't know um, you know, I found something that I found really interesting about the Eurorack market particularly, and this is just, you know, an, an actual observation from talking to a lot of people. Um, the vast majority of users, and this isn't even a jab, this is just a fact, the vast majority of Eurorack users aren't actually making music or making some type of craft. And I mean that not in, an, uh, in a subjective way at all. I mean that objectively. It's like you talk to a lot of people and it's like for them it's it's the equivalent of like, having some sort of collection where you know they'll come downstairs with their morning coffee and kind of wiggle for a little bit or whatever Mm. i'm not knocking that at all i'm just saying that that's a a huge portion of the user base Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you know some of the things that i think about and i do with euro rack i think about from the perspective of someone who's gigging or maybe in the studio or something and it's like very much focused on the act of composing music um and i know that's kind of silly to say with this conversation but it's actually something that needs to be pointed out and you know it's like there's a lot of people who are doing sound design and like processing and all these different mm-hmm. things with your rack that have nothing to do with the idea of like composing music or, or thinking about things in like a collected way like that it's kind of a more free form approach or whatever so mm-hmm. maybe yeah. it's passing by a lot of people for that reason because they're not necessarily even interested in in making music they're kind of doing this other thing with it and mm-hmm. that's again going back to what i was talking about that's like something one of the observations i made about the euro rack market um and why i kind of stepped away from it is because i found that a lot of the decisions that were being made weren't necessarily rooted in like um the pursuit of making and composing music you know yeah so i felt myself kind of dwelling in this whole area of things that weren't helping me get 
on the road I wanted to go to. And granted, there are things to be learned, and I'm not I'm not sitting here like talking shit about your rack at all. I'm just saying that it doesn't align with the type of goals and objectives that I'm trying to accomplish right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So pocket clock it to me is I was like, oh cool, like let's take a, a concept that I did with Mito and Eurorack, like let's take this thing I did with Eurorack and let's take away a three hundred dollar case in power supply and, you know, the need for a molt and a deviant, you know, like seven or eight hundred dollars worth of stuff for a thing that I could put on a business card and charge 125 bucks for that doesn't even need a special power supply. And I'm like, that sounds really interesting to me. That sounds like something I'd like to do, you know? I do it and people are like, yeah. what? what like what is that? What does that do? <laughs> well i'm like it does all the stuff like all the stuff you're asking me to do it's all right there and you just plug it in like that's all you do you don't even have to know how to use it you can literally plug a clock into it and then plug the outputs into shit and it'll immediately start sounding like autiker you know it's like you don't even have to do anything that's what it does by default (laughs) yeah and that's why i was intrigued by the the, the pocket clock because i would um so my 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 journey into eurorack was uh i i started with with several um, desktop module mo- models like the the NTS one by Korg and, and, and some Volkers, and I'm yeah. actually thinking about okay, well, if you then take like you did on on some of your videos where you say okay, well, if you then take your uh, NTS one, you take a couple of pocket operators, you take maybe the, the the random module that you might have, and you then tie them together, you might be getting into even more creative things uh, that you wouldn't have thought possible otherwise. Yeah, I mean something that I do with it, um, you know, it's like it's it's the same reason I made the modular. So that all came from it's this thing I have in my head when I'm making music where I, there's this percussion ensemble that's not the drummer. It's like the equivalent of like the guy with the congas and the shakers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And like uh, for 50% me, it's of like... slip notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so in my head, it's like that's that's the sequencing style that I like to do with your rack, and I like to do you know sixteen step sequencing too. But it's like this kind of g- generative clock division based sequencing, and I'll use that even if I'm not doing that with modular. It's like I use that concept a lot in in a lot of different equipment that I'll use, yeah. where you have the note information separate from the gate information, and they're kind of running on different divisions and stuff, yeah. or even just using it for triggers or whatever. So. I will like take the pocket clock it and even if I'm not doing um your rack stuff with it sometimes what I'll do is I'll record the gates into my computer and use those to duck compressors and stuff or or hmm. trigger audio yeah. gates or whatever where you can use it in the same way you would use a side chain on a kick drum or something or you know and it's just like a quick you know it's like I like to work really quickly and like go through ideas really quick so I'm like plug this thing in go like just like clock it like go record it and i'm like oh that's cool and i'll like you know maybe get a section that works or sounds cool or whatever and i'll just kind of like cut that and you know again though that's that's working with the computer and working in a scenario where it's like i have everything tied in and set up in a kind of recording environment that a lot of people don't do you know it's like a lot of people do different stuff i didn't do that for the longest time like my euro rack system was just two rows and i didn't even use a daw for a while um so i Mm -hmm. get that people use stuff very differently but again this goes back to what i was saying before about the Eurorack yeah. stuff kind of existing as its own instrument in the studio, like another violin or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so pocket where clock it's just put one part of the, the the overall story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like pocket clock. It ties into that where it's like, oh, like here's here's just this thing that I can really quickly generate patterns with and trigger Indeed. equipment with, you Indeed. know, and then kind of move on move on with my day, like not sit there and <laughs> hem and haw and like you know, oh, does this is this compatible with this and blah 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 reset blah blah blah. It's like no, you just like, clock this thing and it spits out a bunch of weird musically relative patterns that you can keep or not keep. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's indeed, like... indeed. Wow, yeah, wow. Yeah, so... I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the time because we're almost at the top of the hour again, and I'm I don't have any hard stops to to be quite honest. Um, but oh, I, st- okay. I still want to give um, the audience some some chances as well. So I I'll need to uh, limit myself to two more questions for you. Um, the first actually being, and I think. I'm really interesting. It really interested in what you're going to say on this. Is if you were to go back to that point in time uh, where you walked into college and first laid eyes on that dope for A100 uh, system, if you were to give that person one piece of advice, what would it be? 
Um, that's wow. <laughs> yeah, it would probably be uh, uh, just keep doing what you're doing, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I'd probably take a long look at that person, and I'd be like, and I'd like about to say something, and I'd be like, "Fuck it, man, it's fine, just do it." <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna say well don't spend too much on your rack or uh, no, don't do this I'm don't like, do that I'm, like, I'm zooming way out on everything and i'm like you know what like everything has happened exactly the way in which it needs to happen you know mm -hmm. it's like all these weird kind of twists and turns and blah 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 and it's like i sit back and i look where i'm sitting now and i look where i was then and i'm like you know what i'm pretty happy with how things went from a to z so they went the way they went because they went that way you know so I wouldn't want to mess. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do the butterfly effect thing, you know, because no. it's like, what if I say, what if I say something and then I wind up doing something lame, you know? Like, what if I wind up on like a super lame, like what if accountant's I, like, opened... job in the city? Yeah, or like, what if I opened an office supply store or something, you know? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry for anyone wrong with that. <laughs> sorry for anyone who's listening who did that. But if it's like, if I did that and I like only listened to Simon and Garfunkel and like never got interested in synthesizer, you know? Sorry if that's your life, but. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that could have been me. Who knows? It could man? be, yeah. Well, I don't know. and I, I, I have to agree that everything that happened along the way did, of course, not only um, result into where you are right now, but also into what kind of person you are right now. Yeah, sure. You know, you got good ideas, you got bad ideas. You're an asshole for a part of your life. You're not an asshole. You know, it's like people grow, they learn, they change. You know. I mean, Absolutely. I'm glad that I can look back to that point in time and say that I have, like, nothing in common with that person, you know? Mm -hmm. I would hope so. I would hope anyone looks back 10 years in their life and they say, like, I'm nothing like that person, you know? That, to me, is, like, the point of being alive. If you look back and you're like, yeah, that's me, <laughs> same guy from 10 years ago. It's like, I don't know that I want to hang out with you, you know? It's like, that's weird. Uh... It's, almost, it's almost sociopathic. I don't know. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. then, then uh, up to my last question, and um, this is something I, I, I tend to do uh, for all of my uh, my interviews. Is I've been I've been ha I had the chance to ask you all kinds of personal questions, so I do want to return the favor and ask if you have any questions for me before we turn it over to the audience. Uh, yeah, I mean, what? I, here's here's my favorite question to ask people that uh, that guy Kinkas asked me one time in. Uh, at knobcon one i think it was like two years ago anyway he said like what is your earliest memory your earliest he called it the the like the the conception in your mind of like the the divine <laughs> the mm -hmm. moment when you saw a synthesizer and the the birth of adam the fingers touched like when was that for you the first time that you saw a synth and you like got like tapped on the head by the like holy synthesizer spirit like when yeah. what was that moment for you um that was um that was a year ago almost to the oh, day really? actually yeah wow so that was um and i've, I've told even I've, even wait even like before your rack and everything like your earliest yeah. memory of any synthesizer and, any synthesizer that really resonated with me that awoke the beast so to say yeah yeah that was a year yeah. ago wow that That's was amazing. a year ago so um, I was. Um, this is this is all COVID lockdown, the whole shebang, right? So what I've what I've done previously is I've done a lot of YouTube work for my uh, for my day job. So I invested in some good audio gear, some good microphones, and I was getting to a point with microphones uh, like the the people you just described that just collect Eurorack, and I was I was getting to that point with, with with microphone so the only thing i did during my downtime was li was reading up on uh audio interfaces on microphones on on all the things there and a lot of people kept telling me yes but the, the thing you just need is you need to have a a proper hobby something that you can really get your creativity going and then i saw that nts1 uh diy kit well it's not essentially diy because it's just you just uh, well, had to screw some things together um, by Korg. Yeah. And I said, well, okay, well, it's a hundred bucks. Um, you know what? I like to play around with things. I like the DIY approach. And if I like it, I like it. If I don't, then it's a hundred bucks, right? So I bought that thing. And I, 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 and I just build it. And I'm like, okay, well, how does this work? So I, I connected it. 
and of course the first thing that happens is if you then connect connect it just to power it, it uses the internal speaker which is like as metallic as can be and yeah. i'm like okay well i'm gonna dive in and i think that after a day or so or maybe maybe even that same day i thought well hey this is something I've never known. I never understood about music. This is something I never knew about uh, sound design. Hey, because I, I've got a physics background, so I, I understand things like like waves and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But this whole thing then just all of the puzzle pieces f uh, fell in their right place, and I'm like, okay, well now it's jamming with me. And then of course uh, we uh, we go to uh, twelve months later, and I'm doing a <laughs> almost a full-time job with a youtube channel and a discord yeah. community <laughs> yeah man i mean that ties in exactly with my whole thing that you were asking about before it's like i was interested in the thing and i just did it you know yeah and it sounds to me like you're doing the exact same thing and taking it this route which is even cooler but just being like oh you know what i am gonna do this youtube channel and this thing and i'm just gonna do it Absolutely, like why the hell yeah. not you know um, so that's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and, I, like, and I still, I, I still have no regrets. <laughs> oh, why would you? You know, and it's like you get to meet all these really cool people, and you know, yeah, it, they're all so humble. It, it, there's, there's, there's like really amazing community. Oh, absolutely. Of, you know, and it's like that's something that, you know, I, I don't know if a lot of people realize that, but it's like underneath all of this, it's like at these events and stuff, and even people who are just really interested in stuff, and they're on the forums and they're talking to the makers. It's like there's very much a sense of actual community still oh, at yeah. play here. And it's like, I have friends, you know, all over the world that make synthesizers that I talk to and, and, you know, have really great relationships with as friends and oh, users yeah. and stuff. And, um, that to me has been the coolest aspect of this. Cause <clears throat> there's, there's like all these different angles too. There's like the YouTube people, there's like the retailers, the makers, the users, you know, the forum people, like, and the, the touring as well. musicians, yeah. Yeah. you know, and it's like, it's it's really cool that um, that can still exist in this world with the internet and the kind of infinitesimal spread of information and stuff like that. People can still kind of come together like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's pretty neat. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah, oh, I appreciate that. So I guess I guess what I'm saying to you is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna be here for a while. No worries. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's cool because it's like most of the people that you'll meet that are like actually involved in stuff are like that though. You know, it's yeah. Like people are really willing to help you and are really friendly and like on the internet people can be really obnoxious, um, especially when you're like looking for help and stuff. But like in real life, like so many people are like oh, really yeah. cool about sharing information and just like. Oh yeah, and and then even the online community has been uh, extremely supportive, especially when I just got started because I I actually just went all in and said, okay, well I don't know nothing. I'm just gonna try it and I'm I'm gonna look for help, gonna look for feedback, and that was amazing. Um, yeah, and people are just like, yeah, sure, here, you know. And that's that that's exactly the thing. So we already have some some additional questions here coming in. So right. uh, again, um, before we start doing those, um, if anyone has a question and they want to join us on stage and ask their question live, uh, just use the uh, raise hands uh, button and we'll get you up on stage. In the meantime, we do have a question from Dang or or Dan G probably. Um, if uh, could we ask about open source, specifically the CC by NCSA? So I know yeah. a bit about Creative Commons, but I don't know all the abbreviations. I do apologize for that. Yeah, so what that means, uh, you credit the original author. Um, you cannot, you're, you're free to modify it. Um, you have to credit the original author and you're not allowed to use it for commercial use. Um, so mm -hmm. basically the way that I conceived of that in my head and people have different interpre interpretations of open source and everything but yeah. I put all of the information all the firmware all the schematics all the code you know everything's up online I purposefully did not upload PCB files I did not upload front panel files um, and the reason why is because I want you if you're economically in a place where you can't afford modular you know, and you want to get my thing for an affordable price. I understand that. And I want that for you. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. I want you to earn it in the same way that I did. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> if you want it, and this is exactly what I did. It's like, if you want it, 
you have to fucking build it you know and it's like not only do you have to build it but you have to either know someone who knows how to lay out a circuit board or you have to learn how to lay out a circuit board or you have to do it on perf board or you have to do it in some way where it's a massive pain in the ass and doesn't make any sense for you and then after that experience you'll want to design your own module or do something else <laughs> but you know I, I have DIY options available for a lot of the stuff or at least I did when it was in, in production that's mm -hmm. the modules uh, and I never did DIY for the manufactured ones because it was really difficult. Like doing the entire Eurorack chapter was was very difficult financially. And one aspect of that was competing with myself. Like the idea of like if I have a DIY thing on the market, people are going to build it and it's going to drive the value of the modules down. And then furthermore, what's going to happen is people who build it and do a terrible job building it, it's going to wind up in the hands of somebody who thinks it's a manufactured product and, you know, they might have a broken thing or whatever, and then I'm liable for it, and I have to repair it, and it's it's kind of this big headache for the business. So mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want clones out there because I don't want it to be confused with my product. Not from a greedy capitalist standpoint, but more than anything else, from a quality control standpoint. Where it's like yeah. I don't want my name, like my name or my business name, on something that either sucks. Well, if it sucks, it's, it better suck by design. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, I don't want it. I don't want it to like break. You know, it's like yeah. one thing I can say very confidently about my work that I'm extremely proud of is I go through great lengths to ensure that the build quality of what you get is rugged as shit. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I don't care how you feel about the design. You know, it's like I'm a builder. Like I do soldering all day. Like yeah. all I do is like build circuits and assemble circuits and build synthesizers. It's like one thing I will say when I go to the grave is like I built things that lasted and didn't break. You know, mm -hmm. so this DIY stuff, it breaks and shit. Yeah, I don't like that. So anyway, back to what we're talking about: the CCBY and CSA. If you want to build one yourself and you want to lay out a board for yourself and only yourself, you are more than welcome to do that. All the information is up there to do it. What you can't do is sell it to other people and do like group buys and stuff because I've seen all of that run off in really nasty directions where people will like get really greedy and they'll start printing off hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and like mm -hmm, yeah. some people have made royalty agreements and things that have gone south and it's just all this big gross mess that I don't want to deal with it's like I did a thing please don't steal my work if you'd like to build one for yourself you are more than welcome to do that and I will you know I gave you already all the information that you need to do that you know yeah so I already did that for you. It's already up on the internet. And it's like, I'm not going to give you a board file. I'm not going to help you build it. Like, that's on you, you know? So if anyone's sitting there thinking like, oh man, I could totally like take these open source designs and like build them for all these people <laughs> who want them. It's like, you can't do that. Technically, you could do that, but you would be a huge dick and I would be very upset with you. So please don't imagine do that. that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, like you have to, the thing, it's like people forget that this is human beings we're talking about here. You know, yeah. it's like, how would you feel if you spent several years of your life developing a thing and putting in all your hard work and everything and you, you put it on the internet to share it with people saying like, I want to share my information with you to help you and like educate you. And like, you know, if you're in a position where you don't have the money and you want to learn a new trade or whatever, or you already have the trade and you want to save some money, it's like, here you go. And then you take that and turn it into, you know, I could get rich quick off of this, you know? And it's like, yeah. I don't like that. And that's, it's happened a lot in, in the DIY community in your rack. And I've seen it happen a bunch of times and it's, it's gross. I don't like it at all. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's how I feel about the CCBYN CSA. No, 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 but that's that's a great answer else. actually, because um, I think that that's something that not everyone was aware of, or at least not even um, taking that into account. Because of course, yeah, there's we, a big, there's a big ethical, things, yeah. yeah, there's a big ethical component to it. It's not even just about money; it's like an ethical thing. It's like you're taking someone's like months and months and months of someone's work and research and development time, and just basically mm -hmm. not compensating them for it at all it's like that's not cool you know no indeed yeah yeah so no but the, i think that that is of course um that that absolutely makes sense and um not to make every open source discussion about behringer but i think that we all have a have, have a <laughs> have a <laughs> have an opinion on that um, yeah, but yeah, I think that that's of course the, the 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 thing that we all want to prevent happening. Because as you say, well, if you're just you and you want to get 
uh, schematics in place and you want to build one for yourself yeah of course uh, more than willing and I'm, I'm yeah just by getting to know yeah. you I'm actually expecting you would actually be able to to, to help and, and handhold people a, a bit as well up until a certain point uh, I used I used to do that and I've stopped doing that because what I realized is that actually doesn't help people oh, it's, it like, it's like them teaching more. them to fish when right they, yeah yeah it's like when you ignore someone it, they're like, well, fuck that guy. I'm going to just like figure it out myself, you know? Like, you know? And then they do, you know, and it's like, thanks for the help. And you're like, you're welcome. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you know? so, I mean, yeah. So, yeah. So we do have some, uh, some, a bit, bit of follow up questions going. We don't have any hands raised yet. So I'm just going to read these out loud. Um, this is from Kyle from uh, Signal Sounds. Uh, the Muffinzeif social media strategy: genius, grand plan, or just having fun? Uh, and he he adds to that he thinks the muffin mix is the best mixer in Euro. Oh, thank you so much! I only made fifty of those, and that means a lot because not many people cared about it. And the people that did care about it really cared about it. So that's cool, man. Thank you. Uh, genius? No, I absolutely not. There is no grand plan. I'm kind of just acting like an idiot on the internet, but. Um, my feeling is that the more the customer uh, realizes who I am the better our connection will be and the truth is, is it's like all the dumb shit I do on the internet like actually is who I am it's like it's not who I am but it absolutely is who I am at the same time so mm -hmm. I'm just having fun there is no deep Machiavellian. There's no board of directors that are like, yes, Ross, like make a Dave Matthews joke again. Like, yes, make another, <laughs> make another, make another fart joke. The 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 clicks, the interaction, the post on that was excellent. The analytics are through the roof. Yes. Based on the metrics, the thing, based on the metrics, yeah. you need to uh, talk a bit more in your uh, lower voice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> based on the metrics, you need to keep smoking weed and making dick jokes on Instagram. That's really yeah, driving yeah. the traffic. Yeah, yeah. Based on these KPIs, you need to invest more in X, Y, and Z. Probably like that. No, man, I'm just having fun. You yeah, know? great. <laughs> Why not? So, uh, following up on that question, this is a bit more of a uh, a three part question, I would say, from Carson. Um, what are your feelings about looking at open source, non commercial schematics for segments of, of SIP circuits or? general inspiration but to be used in a commercial module like if i copy an op amp input for cv into a microcontroller yeah. how does that work yeah. with non-commercial open so, source so, so playing back into my non-commercial open source thing right so i'm yeah. totally okay absolutely okay if you're doing your own product right and it's not like a muskrat clone but you're mm -hmm. like i i want to copy the cv input on your module so i can design my own module that has nothing to do with your module it's like I a hundred percent support that, you know, and it's like in in America we call that copyright infringement, and in in Germany they call that collaborating, you know. Yeah. It's like like I truly believe in my heart of hearts that snippets of code and snippets of schematics and technical information like that should be shared abundantly, and should be used. You know, it's like I would be stoked if people copied my circuits. Your products will probably suck. You know, because I'm not an engineer. But if you if you need a thing of like, oh, here's how he did it. It's like, please do that. You know, and I feel, you know, I've done that. I've talked to engineers about that. And they said that's completely fine. It's like you have to think about it from the standpoint of like, what are you doing? Right. It's like, are you sitting here and you're like, I'm having a hard time figuring out how to get a CV input into a microcontroller so I can do my thing. Right. It's like mm -hmm. if you're from an engineering background, that might be difficult for you. But not being from an engineering background shouldn't stop you from being able to create something that doesn't exist, right? So it's like you would be collaborating with an engineer, helping them integrate it into your design to help you finish a thing. That's a completely different story from I'm going to take your exact circuit and basically screen print it and make my own. It's like those are two completely different conversations, you know? Yeah. So in my opinion, I think it's completely acceptable and to go the extra mile, what I always do, if I'm ever using anything from anyone's thing, I absolutely cite it first and foremost. But before I even cite it, I try to get in touch with the person who made it and ask them for their permission. And most of the time they say yes. You know, and if someone says no, you respect their wishes and you don't. Yeah. You know? Yeah, of course, yeah. But if there's no if there's no indication, if there's no N C on that and it's just C C B Y S A, 
that you you treat the license as it's read you yeah. credit the author you share that's the other thing the share alike aspect yep people don't understand what that means it means if you do that you credit the author and you have to do that yeah you know it's like that's that's the part that people forget so when you think about it in that way where it's this kind of never ending chain of people modifying something and then sharing Welcome. it that's beneficial to everyone yeah. and it's also beneficial to the marketplace it's beneficial to the people who make the parts that go into things you know mm -hmm. the more people there are in the world using the same jack that i use the cheaper my jack becomes and i'm very happy about that yeah. you know <laughs> it's like people people don't understand it in in this kind of more abstract way where it's like the more of us there are out there in the world and the more people there are making things the better it is for everyone involved you know mm -hmm. uh, across every aspect of it not even just money wise but it's like more people equals good you know so i think the gatekeeper shit is not cool um and i i don't personally see an ethical issue with that but other people yeah. feel very strong about things you know so yeah it's also one of the things why i've decided to do all of my videos and everything that i do creatively uh to do that as a uh a cc uh, with a, a, a attribution uh to make sure that people are able to use parts of that so i've had yeah uh, Euro rec makers that you just use parts of my videos for their um, uh, more marketing videos and I'm totally okay with that because that's why, yeah, why I released it like that because I do want to get my on the one hand my name out there but also to make sure that people are able to use what's out there and not just to be yeah. restrictive about it right but you know if somebody was taking your videos and uploading them to some weird YouTube account that racks up bot likes or something to get marketing revenue out of YouTube that would be a different type of scenario right <laughs> absolutely but yeah you know what I mean I, I, so it's like, I, I, I think I'm not big enough to actually worry about that <laughs> well either way I mean I'm not I'm not big enough to worry about that either but you know what I mean it's like that's that's the analogy that I'm talking about here. absolutely it's like one yeah. one one is purely in pursuit of generating revenue and the other one is about actually the content itself and the reason absolutely. why it exists absolutely yeah no, I'm, know, no, so. spot on spot on yeah so let's see if we have do we have any other questions do we have anyone in the audience that uh, wants to raise their hands and then ask any well very well disruptive questions either to russ or to me because otherwise we've been uh, quite well behaved i should say <laughs> and on the other side oh there we go we have dan g or dang yeah i'm just gonna bring them on on stage and see Cool. Whether it's Dang or Dang Dan G, <laughs> I did invite Dang. you once uh, on stage, so you do have to accept that invite. Give them a couple of seconds. Dang. <laughs> no, let's try again. Okay, invite to speak. I'm still expecting that you see something like a pop-up, whether you want to uh, join on stage or not. Yeah. Uh, let's try again. Oh, hold on. He says no pop-up. Oh, that's odd. Or at least then um, you might have something that says uh, join on stage or something. I've never been on that receiving end, so I can't. I can't talk about that. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen any of this chat. Cool. Hmm. Anyone who wants to uh, be a, a guinea pig that I can invite on stage just to see how it works. Could anyone raise their hands? Um, Russ, when I invited you up on stage, uh, what did you see uh, in the in the system? Uh, it said it uh, invited you to speak. Okay. Okay. Well, he, uh, well, uh, Dang or Danji. Uh, I'll just ask the question, what module or device out there do you wish you you had made? That's a good question, actually. I'm sorry, I was I had half my headphone on. Can you ask that again? Yeah, no worries. What module yeah. or device out there do you wish that you had made? That I wish that I had made? Oh, my God. There's so many. I, I So the best synthesizer in the history of synthesizers. I say that with complete confidence. The greatest synthesizer ever made is the OB6 by Dave Smith Ooh. and and Tom Oberheim. And I am 
lucky enough and fortunate enough to say that I own one, and it's single-handedly the best designed, best sounding, best synthesizer. Full stop. I wish I designed that. It's amazing. I I have nothing else to say about it. It's like that good. And um, I I have no like I don't get anything out of saying that. Like nobody's paying me to say that. Like <laughs> I'm telling you, I got that thing, and it was the type of thing where I was like, man, I really want this. And it was kind of the thing where it's like you know like when you're a kid and you're like going to bed every night and you're like, oh man, I really hope like my parents buy me a Nintendo 64. You know, it's like the thing like every <laughs> night you're like you're like posters in your room that you like you like you know put kissy stickers on it every time you see it. And you're like one day. One day, OB6, he'll be, be mine. mine. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, and saved up for it and got it, and it was just like, you know, I'd never even played with one. It was just like I got to hear a bunch of demos of it, and then I finally played with it, and it was like I literally, like, pushed the keyboard when I had enough money, and I, like, pushed the keyboard, and I was like, sold. <laughs> mine. <laughs> mine. And then took it home, and I was like, oh, my God. And it was just like, you know, immediately hit the ground running. Like I had all this music that I wrote and I had all the MIDI done and everything. And I just needed to print it, you know? And I just spent all this time just like running pre-written music through this machine and just getting to do the synth patches on it. And I was just like, great. Yeah. Lord with delight, you know, just like (laughs) amazing. Like every, it's just amazing. Excellent thing. And the other thing that's amazing about it too, is the presets are incredible, which is crazy. It's like I never thought I'd be sitting here saying I'm preaching about presets, but like the the sound designers who worked on that, and I was uh I was looking at the manual the other day. I don't remember who it was, but I think Robert Rich worked on that, or maybe that's the prophet. But whoever did the patch programming on the OB6 deserves a high five. Oh, They're great. excellent. Yeah, excellent presets. So if anyone's on the fence and has the cash to get an OB6, I. I would if I was standing behind you on a cliff, like I would drop kick you in the back and make sure you go flying off the cliff. <laughs> I'd be like, Yes, go do that right now. Like skip your car payment, skip your mortgage payment, don't send your children to college, like don't pay for your health insurance, <laughs> don't buy groceries, get an OB six instead. <laughs> Um, I do have to say here that um, <laughs> Ross does not speak on behalf of the Modular Clubhouse. Please do make sure that you pay and keep up with your mortgage payments, that you do get yeah, your do children through, through through college, yeah, do that you all don't skip do your uh, health insurance payments. Um, and um, yeah, take, take Ross's comments with a grain of salt or a kilo. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So yeah, that thing, I wish I designed the OB6. I oh, am I so envious. Yeah. Of Rob O'Brien. I mean, it's just like 30 years of just like mastery, just like it condensed into one thing. It's so rad. It's like, that's like my nerd alert thing. So I'm like, hell yeah, OB6. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. Good, cool, good answer. I'm going to look into that yeah. as well. And uh, I'm going to. Excellent so, synthesizer. Yeah. Oh, so Grofton asks uh, what your favorite Dave Matthews band song is. You really gotta ask me that, dude? Come on, it's Crash. I, oh, it's, it's it's Grufton. It's not my question. I know. I'm saying to Grufton, you really gotta ask me that. It's Crash. Crash into me. Like, what else would it be? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's Crash into me, man. You gotta play the hits. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a thing called um uh, uh what's it called again? Guilty guilty pleasures, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I hate I I. No, who am I kidding? I love Dave Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Car- <laughs> so, uh, do you guys still have those talent shows on TV? Do we still have those talent shows on TV? Yeah, like like American Idol. Like, oh, probably. Yeah, I don't really watch TV that much, but uh, I yeah yeah those are still on. You need to do that just for shits and giggles. I should do that. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> do you American Idol or something? I don't think I'd get very far. I think they'd see through it pretty quickly. Ah, oh, but still. So uh, Kyle asks uh, if Ro- uh, if Ross is still involved with PGRC. Uh, yeah, I was talking yeah. about that before. Yeah. yeah, I do their drag soldering. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, 
uh, wiggle a thousand uh, follows up with uh, that's only like a semester of college the kids will be fine <laughs> when you'll be six <laughs> dude it's like a year of college like who the fuck are you kidding that was well, expensive no the uh, I'm, I'm, I was just looking up the prices for the OB6 so here um, it's like 31 I got the I got the yeah. I got the desktop one, and I got it. Uh, I waited until I found a a B stock one. Ah. Um. So I was like, I was on it like a hawk. I got a great price on it, and I waited. I was like a tiger in the bushes. Yeah. Just so waiting the, for that OB six. Yeah. The, 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 even the the module one, the the desktop one, is twenty five hundred euros for yeah. us. So that's pro- probably like twenty eight. Yep. US rubles. I got it for, yeah. I got mine for like. I think I got mine for like seventeen fifty, which is oh, wow. insane. Yeah, I like found. I was like, I'm gonna wait till like a bizarre one pops up somewhere. Yeah, and it was like a weird like open box B stock clearance. Weird, you know. I was just like waiting for something like that, and I was like, hell yeah, I'll take that for like five six hundred dollars less than the list price. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> like, absolutely. Yeah, like got it, baby. That's no you brainer. Know? Yeah. But sure but that thing covers like the territory that it covers for that. I mean, obviously it's a huge amount of money, but it's like you get so much out of it. It's like if you just had that synth, that would cover like almost the entire territory of like what you want to do with an analog synth. Honestly, like it does pads and like bass lines and leads and arps and like it's excellent, man. Like it is just an excellent piece of equipment. So, um obviously i mean yeah it's expensive like yeah all this yeah, stuff's s- expensive synthesizers are expensive, i mean two yeah. two two thousand dollars worth of your rack wouldn't even give you a like nothing close to an ob6 you know what i mean it's six full analog voices with yeah. midi and you know all this. it's like if you were to do that in your rack that would cost you an insane amount of money you know like four or five yeah. times the amount of money for six identical voices of something are you crazy with polyphonic note priority and all this there's effects in it you know so i mean my my whole that's the other thing about leaving Eurorack and just being like okay like and i don't even mean this from a user standpoint i also mean this from a design standpoint it's like why make all of this stuff like a whole system offense if the collector's edition is like a little over three grand and it doesn't even do a quarter of what i want it to do you know it's like if i were to redesign that as yeah. like a TR-909, basically. You know what I mean? Like my own version of a drum machine. It's like for that same amount of money, you could cram in way more shit, you know, because you don't have to think about CVIO being compatible with everything and the specialized power supply and all of this other crap, you know. You can you can really... I mean, OB6 is evidence of that. It's like you can cram in an insane amount of stuff mm-hmm. um, and bring the the overall price down and make the whole thing better in my opinion too because it's all like a cohesive thing and you don't have to worry about compatibility issues and stuff um yeah so no perfect so i i i i'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna keep my eye on the beast stock for those as well uh... yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe i just got really lucky but it was... oh still well uh, so so uh wiggle thousand does follow up with Oops, my bad. The average tuition price here is twenty. <laughs> yeah, USD. exactly. Yeah, I was like thinking about health insurance. Yeah, and OB six yeah. is basically free. Twenty thousand USD. Oh, so, dude. Yeah, don't even get me started, man. Jesus, America. Everything is insanely expensive in America. Health insurance is insanely expensive. Everything's expensive. It's insane. Jeez, wow. Yeah. So I think that Easy, I man. I was still. Um, so I was probably well. So here in the Netherlands, we do have to pay something like an uh, an expense payment to the universities uh, and to yeah. um, well our equivalent of college as well. Um, but I think that that was never more than fifteen hundred per year, and that oh was for God. the the expenses. And and then you do get some subsidies on top of that. So yeah, well, whew. yeah. Then I uh, yeah. understand that if you just skip one of those payments, yeah, you can indeed buy an OB six. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we have. Oh, uh, I do hear the ping again. Uh, Scotland, free healthcare, free university. Yeah, Kyle. Absolutely. I want to. Okay. Hey, whoever is that? That's Kyle from Signal Sounds. Ask. Yeah. Okay, Kyle, you can hear me. What am I even saying? Uh, Kyle, I want you to sponsor me. I want to move to Scotland and I want to work <laughs> on a salmon farm. I'm dead serious. Farm. I've thought about this so many times. It's like, I love cooking. I love food. And it's like, I would probably be happy as a pig and shit, just like scooping salmon feed and flicking it into a pond. 
you know, and just like doing like one of those dirty jobs. Like, I mean, I basically, I solder all day. It's the same thing. So I would love to just like pick up my life and move to Scotland, like leave the synthesizer thing behind and just like <laughs> hang out, you know, in some beautiful industrial pastoral landscape that's probably in a room with fluorescent lights and white walls. <laughs> <laughs> Never see the sun. My like my like romantic image of what a salmon farm is in Scotland is just not even remotely. Accurate. You have you have Kyle's um, word that he's going to keep an eye out for job openings for you. Yeah, I'll wind up in Scotland one day. Oh yeah, I'll just like I'll come out. Just of do a, a whiskey bog. trail and yeah, that would be amazing, man. I've never been to Scotland. I would love to do that. Oh, I still it sounds like such a cool place. List. It's still on my list man. as well, and it's it's just across the pond for me. It's like that's can, wild, man. I can just fly into well. I can. Uh, that's probably like an hour and a half flight for me, and I still haven't been there. Um, Damn, dude! To, you should go to Scotland. You should do that. Yeah, let, let let's do that. I'm I'm gonna make sure. I'm gonna check with the uh, the minister of finance here in the house and make sure that we can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just do it. Just walk. <laughs> I mean, walk there. It's close enough that you can just walk there. Yeah, man. but I need to swim then as well, and and of course I could. Well, just 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 walk. Well, to, to go but to go back to um, uh, to where we started our talks with, and that's of course the Dutch resistance in World War yeah. Two. So we had what we called Engeland Vaarders, which uh, literally translates to uh, the the people that 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 just go to England, and they did that with all kinds of odd contraptions just to cross the channel. Yeah. And we now have still an ongoing thing where people try to swim across the channel, and they they film that, they make a big media thing of that. So um, well, yeah, we could we could probably do that. <laughs> I think I think you should do that. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good to get some extra exercise in once the lockdown is done again. Um, so <laughs> I do think that we uh, will need to wrap this up, Ross. It's it's been. An honor, a pleasure, and um, an absolute blast having you here on the show. I have to promise you that this is not going to be the last time you're going to be here because I uh, oh, really thanks. enjoyed having you. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, man. It's, of course, it's man. cool. It's great. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, for everyone else who has joined us live, thanks so much for the interaction. Thanks so much for listening in. Uh, for those of you who are listening here to the recording, uh, thanks for uh, for tuning in. I'm going to do some post-production to uh, make sure that we get some of the uh, the noises I created out of there. And um, yeah, for now, I would say, please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy. And um, we're going to see each other for our next meeting, which is going to be next Tuesday. And I... Uh, let's see. That would be with Fuckluff from Bastel. Um, so one of the things we're going to be talking to Fuckluff about is, of course, the new Soft Pop 2 that was just released yesterday. And that's I've I've just looked at the loop up video uh, going through that uh, that that desktop synth, and it just blew me away. So it, make sure that you uh, tune in for that show as well on Tuesday the 11th. Um, Russ, again, thank you so much for joining, and we'll be in touch. Uh, everyone yeah, else, take care. And, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Cheers. Bye bye. Yeah, later.